Android phone manufacturers don't patch as much as they should. Gray Key lets cops unlock encrypted iPhones and everything you need to know about the Facebook Zuckerberg hearing. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings, I am Shannon Morris and this is ThreatWire for April 17th, 2017. Your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. Our Patreon is at patreon.com slash threatwire and that is always the best way to support the show and will help us reach our next goal. So if you want access to exclusives, check out the Patreon link in the show notes below. And now, on to the news. First off, we have Android. So our top story this week was chosen by our Patreon patrons and is all about Android. With over 2 billion Android devices currently in use worldwide, it's pretty important that these phones be updated each time a new update is available to patch security holes. Google's own phones, the Pixel line, they continue to be the most up-to-date since the patches come from their own home base. But many other vendors have stated that they have upped their game when it comes to releasing these patches on a timely basis every single month. Now, security researchers at the Security Research Lab tested multiple samples of 23 different manufacturers to determine how often they patch and if they were missing any of the critical or high severity patches in their updates. They released their findings on April 13th at the Hack in the Box conference in Amsterdam. Samples were in lots. Either they had a few, which means they had 5 to 9, many, which means they had 10 to 49, or lots, which means they had 50 plus samples, with around 3,000 phones tested total. Vendors that did include the critical patches include Google, Samsung, and Sony, and a few others. Ones that were missing four or more critical patches for vulnerabilities include ZTE, TCL, and others. Vendors like OnePlus, Motorola, HTC, LG, and Huawei were somewhere in between. The researchers were able to determine which patches were missing by looking at the binary itself on each and every phone that they tested. SRL explained that just because a patch is missing does not necessarily mean the device is vulnerable to a hack in the event that they still have received all the other updates needed to protect against a known issue. And with Android's built-in sandboxing and ASLR, that's probably the case. Now with that said, they also linked to an app called Snoop Snitch, which they created that can help you determine if you've received all updates needed on your phone, but active monitoring with this app requires a rooted device with a Qualcomm chipset, which not all Android devices use. The problem is many of these manufacturers have been lying to their users. When you go into your settings and you check your updates and your phone says you are up to date, you expect that you would already have received all of the updates available. But the SRL researchers exposed the problem. Several manufacturers would simply and quietly skip certain patches while sending you the rest of them. So some phones were missing multiple patches even if the phone said that it was up to date. Now as always, patching is a must but you may want to move to iPhone. But I guess those are also kind of screwed as well. Ah, uh, yes, the iPhone. Yeah, those are screwed too. At least in their current state of encryption, they are. In reports by Motherboard and Malwarebytes Labs, a device called GrayKey can brute force encryption on iOS devices, even with the newest operating systems, including iOS 11, for as little as $15,000. A company called GrayShift, which was founded in 2016 in Atlanta, Georgia, has been selling small, boxy devices called GrayKeys to federal agencies and local law enforcement offices in the United States. Prices for a year-long license are either $15,000 for a connected version with 300 uses, so that's 300 iPhones, or $30,000 for an offline version with unlimited uses, so they'd be able to use this as many times as they want. Now, when a law enforcement agent needs to use the device, they plug an iDevice into the gray key and it starts brute forcing the encryption. It is controlled by a web UI and it requires no special training to use. Once running on a device, it'll take a couple of hours to a few days to unlock and break the encryption on the device. It works on any numeric passcode lock and Malwarebytes suspects that it uses a jailbreak technique, though no hard technical data or evidence is available publicly. Many security researchers think that it replaces iBoot firmware with a custom boot firmware that defeats each layer of security. The devices are only sold to verified law enforcement by the creator, which is again, GrayShift. The $15,000 
$1,000 version uses a geofencing technique so that once it's hooked up to a network and set up, it can only be used on that one network. Unfortunately though, networks can be spoofed or compromised, wireless or wired, with LAM taps or other devices like <coughs> a pineapple. So whether or not they protect against attacks is yet to be determined. The $30,000 option is an offline model that requires a two-factor authentication code to work, but how and where the two-factor authentication code is stored could be a very important factor in its security. According to letters and emails leaked to Motherboard, agencies have already purchased or they are currently receiving quotes for the devices, including the DEA, the FBI, Secret Service, along with many small local law enforcement offices. Now the implications are tremendous for a device like this. Even if a device like this never ended up on the black market, which I suspect that it would if it was resold by a law enforcement agency, a license could be copied and networks can be spoofed. But even if it never gets out into a public space, many innocent citizens could see their iPhones being decrypted by this device during a court case, then turned over afterwards. But what does the device do to the phone? Would that broken encryption be fixed upon wiping the operating system, or is this really a boot issue? Would their phones forever be vulnerable to any hacks? Could someone reverse engineer this device and break its security measures? It works with a web GUI, so is that web GUI secure? Who knows? And I have so many questions. In the meantime, this seems to only work against phones that use passcode protection, so if you switch to authentication with an alphanumeric passcode instead, that might help. Apple has not released a statement about the device at time of recording, so we are unsure if they will be releasing any better encryption as well. Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook spent two days in Congress hearings answering questions about the business that he runs and how they handle security and privacy of their users. Much of it was not very exciting or breaking news, to be honest, but I did want to point out a few pertinent details that came to light from the hearings. One detail that was brought up by Representative Ben Lugin, a Democrat from New Mexico, was the idea of a shadow profile. So this is where Facebook collects valuable data about you from various data analytics firms, as well as the profile of data that you have put on the page yourself. This is data from sites that you make purchases on, because yay cookies and data brokers, as well as things that you have liked, disliked, or followed. This data is used to show you tailored ads, which is why, even if you don't have a brand's page on Facebook or mention it on Facebook, you will still see an ad for it based on browsing habits or other social platforms. Unfortunately, we did not get any kind of meaty questions due to the fact that many senators just did not know how Facebook worked, or they got confused about the terminology. Zuckerberg did receive several questions that he was unable to answer, and many of these had to do with specifics of handling data or amounts of data kept, which the CEO said that his team would follow up on. Surprisingly, they had heard about the conspiracy theory that Facebook listens to your conversations and serves up ads based on those convos, and he did deny the claim. Zuckerberg had to repeatedly explain that Facebook does not sell data to advertisers, but it does give access to that data to third parties. Senator John Cornyn, a Republican of Texas, was concerned that users did not know or understand Facebook's terms of service, and the data they agreed to give away was not informed consent. Zuckerberg agreed that users probably do not actually read the terms of service. Oops. Senators did miss a good opportunity to ask Zuckerberg about Russian pages that were operating to influence narratives. He did receive a few questions regarding this topic, but neither went into very much detail as far as how Facebook acted, nor did we find out if Facebook deleted any kind of data beforehand, or if any of their employees offered assistance to the Russian agency, the Internet Research Agency, or the IRA. We did learn that Facebook has talked to Special Prosecutor Robert Mueller, but Zuckerberg did not comment on what those conversations were about. Mueller has been investigating the Russian ties to the US's 2016 election, and given the amount of accounts on Facebook created to post paid ads and organic regular posts about hot issues, this does not necessarily come as a surprise. 
Facebook also had some positive news. The company is launching a new bug bounty with payouts as much as $40,000 for reports about data abuse on its platform by app developers. Facebook also stopped fighting against a major privacy bill that was proposed in California. It's called the California Consumer Privacy Act to go on November's ballot, and it would give users an option to opt out of data collection and forces companies to explicitly state what data they are collecting. The companies would also be held liable of any kind of breach of data. Facebook had donated $200,000 to the Committee to Protect California Jobs, which is a group that was fighting against the act. Of course, I am a little bit skeptical with the countless times that Zuckerberg said, I don't know, or I'll have to have my team follow up with you on that. It sounds like he doesn't know how to run his own company, but I do suspect that he didn't want to give any hard facts in such a public forum when so many users are watching, perhaps until the news dies down, maybe? Unfortunately for Facebook though, they have been in the news for a few straight months now, and I do not see that changing anytime soon. I want to give a shout out to our patrons on Patreon for sharing their favorite news on the community tab. If you are a Patreon patron, you can send in your favorite stories on that community tab to get featured in the show. And every Friday, I'm going to pick three or more top stories for a voting poll that patrons can vote on to be included in next week's show. Everyone who supports ThreatWire at patreon.com slash ThreatWire are the reason that we can keep on bringing you news every single week. We are on the way to our next goal, which allows me to cover the cost of upgrading some of this equipment here and we will also open up a live video Q&A just for patrons each and every month. And if you are already a patron, you get access to an audio RSS feed, first looks at show topics, polls, discussions just for patrons, and a whole lot more, and any little bit helps us grow the show. This month, my goal is to get to 850 patrons. We are just short of reaching that goal, so sharing the show with your friends, signing up to donate just a dollar a month, it all helps a ton. And thank you so much to everybody who sends in cute little fur babies. I love checking them out, and they are adorable from some of our Patreon supporters too. Check out the perk levels on Patreon. Thanks for keeping this show completely independent. And if you cannot donate, hit that subscribe button. Don't forget to share the episode. And with that, I'm Shannon Morris, and I will see you on the internet.